I'm just going to invite the Lord to be here one more time, those that are able. Our Heavenly Father, once again, we come before your throne of grace to seek your help. I've asked the Holy Spirit to speak through me the words you've given today. Lord, I pray that your holy angels will be here and keep the enemy away. And I pray for your presence to strengthen me and to be with us. As I give the message that you've put on my heart and also that I can learn and others from the things that you have to say to prepare for your soon coming. I ask this now in the name of Jesus. Amen. The title, as you can see, is called Three Kings, uh, Three Roads. You know, I don't often tell my personal testimony because there are things that I'm not proud of myself. Uh, in my past, I was raised as a fourth generation Seventh-day Adventist by um, loving parents. My father was a missionary who started two churches in the Los Angeles area. So I knew the truth growing up. He was a very loving, kind, and compassionate man, but he was very strict with us. And uh, we used to joke around. He had five sons. And I joke with my brothers, well, we don't need to join the military because we're already in the military. But he was all business when it came to the Lord's business. Uh, he wanted the best for us. But at, when I went out on my own at 18, I went out in the world because I took the prodigal son's road. And I would have stayed on that road until the Lord arrested me. And he arrested me one day. Um, I was looking for success. I thought I had it. You know, I, I managed several banks in the Los Angeles area. I was making good money. I traveled the world. I thought I had everything. And one day, uh, two bank robbers came in the bank and they asked to see the manager and I, and I was pointed out. And the next thing I knew, I had a gun pointed at the back of my head. I could feel the steel of that gun. And at that moment, your whole life runs before you because there had been a couple murders by two robbers that hadn't been solved just a few weeks before. I didn't know if it was the same two men or not. And I prayed. I said, Lord, I knew that if they had pulled the trigger, I wouldn't be standing here today and I'd have been eternally lost. And I'm thankful that the Lord heard my prayer and he arrested me on that road and brought me back to where I needed to be, to seek him with all my heart. So the message today, which is called Three Kings, Three Roads, this is a story of three kings in Israel whose lives took three different roads. Now the stories hold a significant lesson for all of us today, and we can all learn from these lessons, as you'll soon see, as their lives and experiences unfold for us. And even though that their stories are vastly different from each other, we can all learn from their mistakes and how they each differently responded to God's correction and his rebuke for their sins and their responses to the correction that God gave them determine their success or their failure in this life and where each will end up in the final judgment. Each of these three kings represents a segment of our society today. It represents people in the church and they represent people in the world. And each one is making their decision for Christ, for eternal salvation or for eternal loss. That's a decision each one of us has to make. And as we look at the lives of these three kings, then we'll understand why I say it applies to three different segments of the population and in the church. So the scripture text again was, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. 
Be zealous, therefore, and repent. So as we begin the first story, we're going to see that each of these three kings, as I stated, will represent a class of people in the church and in the world. So the first king is King Saul. Now, all of us here are already familiar with the story of King Saul. He was the very first king of Israel, and we all know that Israel prospered because they acknowledged Jehovah as their king. But the Israelites, they wanted to be like all the other worldly nations around them. And unfortunately, we're seeing that happening again today. History is repeating itself. They wanted a king. They wanted to be just like the world, just like the other nations. They wanted to conform to all the worldly customs and practices instead of being the peculiar people that God wanted them to be. So God gave them a king in his anger because they rejected him. Let's look at that. Turn to Hosea, Hosea 13, and we're going to read verse 9 to 11. Hosea 13, 9 to 11. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thine help. I will be thy king, where is any other that may save thee in all thy cities, and thy judges whom, of whom thou saidest, give me a king and princes. I gave thee a king in mine anger, and took him away in my wrath. So, as I'm sure you already know, that this experiment, to be like all the other nations, did not end well for the kingdom of Israel. Their desire to conform to worldly customs and practices existed then, in their day, and it still exists today among God's professed people. Let's take a look, patriarchs and prophets. Like all the nations... The Israelites did not realize that to be in this respect, unlike other nations, was a special privilege and blessing. God had separated the Israelites from every other people to make them his own peculiar treasure. And I want you to notice these words that are underlined here. It says, but they, disregarding this high honor, eagerly desired to imitate the example of the heathen, and still the longing to conform to worldly practices and customs exists among the professed people of God. And continuing on, it says, as they depart from the Lord, they become ambitious for gains and honors of the world. And notice here it says, Christians are constantly seeking to imitate, right, the practices of those who worship the God of this world, a few or many. It says, many urge that by uniting with worldlings and conforming to their customs, they might exert a stronger influence over the ungodly, end quote. I've heard a pastor tell me that very thing. Oh, we have to unite. Uh, we have to go out and meet them where they are because, you know, that way we can have a better influence. We have to do what they do. This is what a pastor told me. Friends, we don't have to unite with the ungodly to bring them to Christ. And today, we hear the exact same excuses for uniting with the worldly and uniting with the worldly churches. But the end result is still going to be the same. We are going to separate ourselves from God. And he's the only source of our strength and our holiness. So to gratify their desires, the Israelites said, give us a king. And so Saul was chosen. He had the appearance of a king, but he lacked self-control. Let's look at 1 Samuel 9.2. 1 Samuel 9.2. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man and a goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. 
From his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. So he started out, Saul started out with a humble spirit, relying on God's help. That's how he started, but that was soon to change he, because he couldn't control his passions. Notice what it says here. Of noble and dignified bearing in the prime of life, comely and tall, he appeared like one born to command. Yet with these external attractions, Saul was destitute of those higher qualities that constitute true wisdom. Underlined here, he says, he had not in youth learned to control his rash, impetuous passions. He had never felt the renewing power of divine grace. And see, sometimes when our parents correct us, sometimes we want to rebel. We thought, man, my father's really strict. He doesn't tolerate any nonsense or foolishness. Maybe because he had five sons, he had to be that way with us. But I'm thankful now. But what happens when a parent just allows a child to do whatever they want, anytime they want? They become rebellious and they become impetuous and they just act on their rash emotions, right? So these qualities that he never learned to control, it prepared Saul for his downfall. So when through the power of God he experienced early success in battle, he became very overconfident in himself and he became presumptuous. So instead of seeking God in wisdom and relying on him, he was rash and he was impetuous. And the story that Saul was, he was facing an immense force of Philistines at Mishmash, prepared for the battle, and he was given instructions by Samuel that when he returned, he would come and we'd offer burnt offerings to the Lord, and then God would instruct him on what he needed to do. But Saul was impatient. He decided, I'm not going to obey the Lord's instructions. I'm going to offer my own burnt offering. So let's turn in our Bibles to 1 Samuel 13, and let's read that. 1 Samuel 13, 9 to 14. Saul didn't want to be controlled. He wanted to control himself. And 9, it says, And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash, therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offer to burnt offerings. Notice how he says he forced himself. He, he was trying to excuse what he did. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. And verse 14, But now thy kingdom shall not continue the Lord hath sought a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. So Saul was unwilling to humble his heart because he knew better. He didn't want to rely on God because of, he was impressed with his own wisdom, and he felt that he wanted to be in control. And there are many people today that don't want to give up control. They want to maintain control of their own lives, just like Saul. So he refused to obey uh, the instructions of God. So notice what it says here. It says, if Saul had shown a regard for the requirements of God in this time of trial, God could have worked his will through him. His failure now proved him unfit to be the vicegerent of God to his people. And notice what it says there. It says he would mislead Israel 
His will rather than the will of God would be the controlling power. So Saul didn't want to give up his will to God. He wanted to maintain his own will. And notice here, it says, We do not know what great interest may be at stake in proving of God. In the proving of God, it says, There is no safety except in what? Strict obedience to the word of God. So we can't be halfway obedient. Well, I'll do a little bit of what he says, and then the rest I'm just going to do what I want, right? It says strict obedience. So it says all his promises are made upon condition of faith and obedience. And a failure to comply with his commands cuts off the fulfillment to us of the rich provisions of the scriptures. So in other words, we can't pick and choose what we want to do. The Bible isn't a buffet that we can pick the things we like and reject the things we don't like. We have to either take it all or take none of it. It's an all or nothing scenario here. It's an all or nothing. Saul proved to be his own worst enemy because he really refused to repent and he refused to be reputed of his own sin. Notice what it says here. It says, Saul was in disfavor with God, yet unwilling to humble his heart in penitence. And there's people like that today that even though they know they're doing wrong, they don't want to humble their hearts. They don't want to be reproved. So we're told that Saul dishonored God by his unbelief and his disobedience and by his continued rebellion and his stubbornness, eventually he came under the full control of Satan because he continued to rebel. He wanted to have his own way. Let's turn to 1 Samuel 15 and let's look at verse 22 and 23. Verse 22, and Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of what? Richcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Now, who does this remind you of? It reminds you of Cain, right? I'm just going to give whatever I want as an offering. I'm not going to obey the Lord. I'm going to do what I want. So Saul, he stubbornly justified himself for his sin of presumption because Saul didn't really carry a sacred regard for the will of God. And so he was totally unfit to be king. He traveled down the road that led to his destruction instead of accepting counsel and rebuke for his transgressions. He sought to make excuses to justify himself and to justify his course of wrong action. And when you hear people, maybe even in leadership positions or other positions that are rebuked for their sin and they defend it, make excuses for it, or they want to attack others for calling them out. You have to wonder, do they have the spirit of Saul? Are they going down the same road that Saul is? How many church members today, even in positions of the highest authority, are really traveling down the same road that Saul traveled down? And we are all given the same opportunity to repent. And we reject the counsel. We reject it at our own peril. Because that counsel could save us from destruction and eternal separation from God. And then we follow down a path that leads us to eternal loss. I know that I could have easily been taken out. But God in his mercy gave me an up, another opportunity. And I wasn't about to give up that second chance. Some members will even attack those who lift their voices in warning and reproof of open sin. So let's read this from Patriarchs and Prophets. Those who are most ready to excuse or justify themselves in sin are often most severe in judging and condemning others. Notice this word, many, like Saul, bring upon themselves the displeasure of God, but they reject counsel and despise reproof. Even when convinced that the Lord is not with them, 
They refuse to see in themselves the cause of their trouble. They blame everyone else. They blame the lady. They blame everyone else but themselves. They cherish a proud, boastful spirit while they indulge in cruel judgment or severe rebuke of others who are better than they. We all know the sad end to Saul's life. When he consulted a sorceress, he then fully, fully uh, put himself in the hands of Satan. So God abandoned him, and Satan led him down the road to his own destruction. So what a terribly sad ending for a life that was once honored by God as the first king of Israel. And it didn't have to be that way. All he had to do was to let the Lord have his will, give up his own will to God, but he refused to do that. And in contrast to Saul, we'll look at the second king uh, of Israel, King David. Now, David was called a man after God's own heart, but he also had his share of troubles. Uh, he traveled down a different road than Saul traveled, and at times, Saul even attempted to take his life, but God was protecting him. So because of Saul's rebellion, God asked Samuel to anoint a new king over Israel. Let's read that, 1 Samuel 16.1. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil, and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And let's drop down and read verses uh, 10 through 13. And again Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel, and Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ready and withal of a beautiful countenance, and goodly to look at. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil, and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Now I'm sure his father was saying, well, look, you know, my oldest son, some of them may have been greater in stature, may have looked the part, but God still looks on the heart, and he knew the heart of David. So turn again to 1 Samuel 18, 6-9. But before that, we want to remember that King Saul's, when he realized that he was rejected of God, then he became filled with uh, rebellion and despair. When David killed Goliath, Saul became enraged because David was exalted above him in the song of the women of Israel. That enraged him. So turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel 18. Let's read that, verse 6 to 9. And it came to pass, as they came, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets, with joy, and with instruments of music. And the women answered one another as they played, and said, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me have they ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day forward. Can you imagine there he promotes himself as a mighty warrior and all of a sudden they're saying that David killed 10,000, you only kill 1,000. So he was very angry. And from that day forward, David became a fugitive and he had to flee for his life. 
But God was with David through all the trials that tested him and tested his faith. So after Saul's death, uh, when David was king, he faced many more tests and trials of his faith. Because the enemies of Israel, they surrounded David. But unlike Saul, David always relied on the Lord's counsel. So David obeyed God implicitly, and God rewarded David with many mighty victories that he would not have had had he not obeyed. And it was at this time in his ease and self-security that David yielded up to the temptation of Satan. He started to become very impressed with the victories that he had. He began to trust in his own wisdom and might, and then Satan saw an opportunity to lead David into sin. Let's turn in our Bibles to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel 11, 1 to 3. And it came to pass, after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon, and besieged Rabbah, but David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass in evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? We know that David, he involved himself in this adulterous affair with Uriah's wife. And then he compounded his sin by having her husband killed. Can you imagine that? So not only did he have an adulterous affair, but he decided to take the husband out of the way. Let's drop down and read verses 14 to 17. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab, and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him, that he may be smitten and die. And it came to pass, when Job observed the city, that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that valiant men were. And the men of the city went out and fought with Job, and there fell some of the people of the servants of David, and Uriah the Hittite died also. So notice that even though David walked in the counsel of the Lord, when he departed from God, God was never going to justify him in that wicked sin, regardless of how faithful he had been in the past. All that faithfulness didn't count when he sinned this perverse sin against God. And notice what it says here in Spiritual Gifts. I was shown that it was when David was pure and walking in the counsel of God that God called him a man after his own heart. When David departed from God and stained his virtuous character by his crimes, he was no longer a man after God's own heart. God did not in the least degree justify him in his sins, but sent Nathan, his prophet, with dreadful denunciations to David because he had transgressed the commandment of the Lord. Now notice this. It says, God shows his displeasure at David's having a plurality of wives by visiting him with judgments and permitting evils to rise up against him from his own house. The terrible calamity God permitted to come upon David, who for his integrity was once called a man after God's own heart, is evidence to after generations that God would not justify anyone in transgression, transgressing his commandments, but that will surely punish the guilty. However righteous and favored of God they might once have been while they followed the Lord in purity of heart. End quote. So, what did David do when Nathan came to him with words of rebuke 
for his grievous sin? Did he say, oh no, you can't speak against, I'm the Lord's anointed. You can't speak against me, right? Did Nathan say, oh, I'm sorry, Lord, I, I, can't, I can't speak anything against him. He's the Lord's anointed. If he would have refused to do that, he would have brought the displeasure of God upon him. Let's read that. 2 Samuel 12, 7 to 10. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and has taken his wife to be thy wife, and has slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. And let's, let's drop down and read verse 13 and 14. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, the Lord has also put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. How be it? Because this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Now, if David would have said, no, I'm not going to accept your rebuke. I'm the president. I'm whoever, whatever. I'm the king. He would have died in his sins. David could have reacted just like Saul. How dare you rebuke me or criticize me, right? I'm the Lord's anointed. He didn't react that way. You can't say anything about me or my sin. Remember that Saul was so blinded by stubbornness and pride that he even put the priests of the Lord to death. That's how blinded he was. But David had a vastly different spirit within him. He didn't try to defend himself. Instead, he humbled his heart and repented before the Lord. Letter 106, David learned wisdom from God's dealing with him. He confessed his sin, accepted the counsel given him, and obeyed in humility before God. Those are the key words right there in, in light blue. He obeyed in humility. He made no tirade against the law which he had transgressed, but exclaimed, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. So he had a willingness to be corrected. He had a willingness to accept rebuke. How many of us today are willing to confess and repent of our sins before God in humility like David, while there's others like Saul who prefer to defend and excuse their sin and attack those that raise their voice when they are confronted with it? These are two very different roads that each of these kings took, and they're quite different from each other. This brings us to this, the third story. And we must remember that these are two opposite directions. One ended in destruction. So we have to choose wisely because we all have that choice. It says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit with, within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. That is the sound of the words of a man that is truly repentant. So this brings us to the story of the third king of Israel, a third king of Israel, Manasseh. He took another road that was quite different from Saul and David. So let's read about him. Let's turn in our Bibles to 2 Chronicles 33, 1 to 3. This king was pure evil. He's listed in the Bible as the most evil king of Judah. It says, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. So he was the longest reigning king, but he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like unto the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. For he built again the high places which Hezekiah, 
his father had broken down. He reared up all altars for Balaam, and he made groves, and he worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. So Manasseh started down the path of evil from the time he first started the reign in Israel. I mean, it only got worse from there. Let's drop down and read verse 6. And he caused his children, notice that, to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Also he observed times and used enchantments and used witchcraft and dealt with a familiar spirit and with wizards. He wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. How much more evil could this king have been? He sacrificed his own children. That's how evil he was. So most people would have said, this guy has no hope. He's just pure evil. So Manasseh was working directly for Satan from the time he started to reign. But God is a merciful God. And although he could have instantly destroyed Manasseh for his horrific sins, he gave him another chance. And watch what happened. Let's read verse 9 to 13. So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err and to do worse than the heathen, it says, whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns, and bound him with fetters, and carried him to Babylon. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God, and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers, and prayed unto him. And he was entreated of him, and heard his supplication, and brought him again to Jerusalem, into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. How many people would have given this wicked king a second chance at all? There are some people who will only ever learn the hard way. And then there's others who will never learn. There's a saying that some people, most people learn from their mistakes. Some people learn from the mistakes of others, but a fool never learns. So, we have to be those that will learn not only from our mistakes, but from the mistakes of others. But how different Manasseh's reign was from that of King Saul or King David. And did you notice how Manasseh, it says he humbled himself greatly before the Lord because he felt the fires of affliction. We shouldn't have to feel the fires of affliction to humble ourselves, but there are some people that have to feel that or they'll never humble themselves. So this is letter 94. In the case of Manasseh, the Lord gives us an instance of the way in which he works. Now listen to this. He says, we read, Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err and to do worse than the heathen whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. But notice this, it says, and the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. So they didn't even want to listen. Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host and of the kings of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. And when he was, what? In affliction, he besought the Lord his God. See, he wouldn't have sought out the Lord God if he wasn't in affliction. In other words, he was one of those people that had to learn the hard way, right? He humbled himself greatly before God and of his fathers and prayed unto him. And he was entreated of him and he learned his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. God would have never brought him back to Jerusalem had he not humbly repented and truly confessed and felt sorry for his wicked sins that he did. Notice this, it says the Lord has often spoken to his people in warning and reproof. He has revealed himself in mercy, love, and kindness. 
He has not left his backsliding people to the will of the enemy, but has borne long with them, even during obdurate apostasy. But notice, after appeals have been made in vain, he prepares the rod for punishment. So God is a patient, loving God. He's long forbearing with apostasy and wickedness, but there comes a point in time when God says enough. And we can see the application to God's people for each of these three kings. It represents the people in the church and the world today. These three kings even represent our leaders and pioneers all down through the history of Adventism. If you read the history of Adventism, there were some early pioneers that had the benefit of living at the time of Ellen White, so they had a living prophet there to guide them, and they rejected her counsel, and as a result, they ended up leaving the denomination. And some people say, you know, if I had been alive back then and could have consulted with the prophet, I would have obeyed. No, some people would not have obeyed. Some, like Saul, they start out strong, but then they waver and they fall into apostasy because of pride, because of stubbornness, and because of a lack of humility. And my wife and I are reading about some of the pioneers in Adventism, and it's shocking that some of them completely not only turned their back on Adventism, but they attacked the prophet. After having known her, they still attacked and left Adventism altogether, and they sealed their probation is closed. So many become lifted up in their own eyes and they refuse to be corrected in any way. We have to have a love for the truth. We have to have a sincere love for the truth. Those that don't have a love for the truth, just like some of the early pioneers who walked away from Adventism and others were lost because they refused to humble themselves and they refused to repent of their sins. So they walked down the road to destruction then you're going to see those who like, are like King David. They come into the truth of the very humble spirit. They have a sincere desire to walk with the Lord in truth and in righteousness. But sometimes, somewhere along the way, they might become discouraged. They might lose their hold on the Savior. They might sin because they get involved with the pleasures of the world or they're drawn into sin and apostasy gradually without them even realizing it. So they become self-sufficient and complacent. They start singing the temple of the Lord are these when they don't realize that they're not in God's temple because they've separated themselves from him. It's not enough to be a Seventh-day Adventist anymore, friends. We have to be one with Christ. We have to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ. So. Some become self-sufficient and complacent, and they really believe that their condition is far better than it really is. And then before they realize it, they've dishonored God, and then they separate themselves from him. But when they are corrected, or when they're pointed out, when the Holy Spirit convicts them, they do humble their, themselves in repentance and conviction and contrition before God, and then they return to the path of righteousness to walk with the Lord, and then they're saved from eternal ruin. And then you have people like Manasseh. They start out as a complete disaster. They're sinning from day one. Or they're, in, they're leading a lifelong life of sin. Maybe they know what's right, but they're inclined to just follow their own sinful desires. And God really doesn't have a part in their lives. So they continue down a road of sin and self-gratification, and that road would lead to their eternal ruin. Until one day, God brings the fires of affliction upon them, and he uses the rod of correction and punishment, and it turns them around. And it's only as they pass through the fiery trials like Manasseh did, or King Nebuchadnezzar, that they realize there is a God in heaven, and that can keep them from complete and utter destruction. And then he's the only one that can rescue them from the snare of Satan. And they realize it, realize it and they take hold of God and said, yes, I confess and repent of all of my sins. Take control of my life because I give my life to you. And when they do that, regardless of how black their past is, God brings them back and saves them. What a wonderful God we, we worship. 
you know, they realize it's only God that can save them, and without him, they surely will perish. And there are people that are going to be in heaven that we won't even know how they made it there. God in his mercy and love hears and answers their prayers. Because they humble their hearts in sincere repentance and reformation, and with his loving arms of mercy, he pulls them out of the fires of affliction. So friends, we know which road will lead to eternal loss like King Saul. And we also know that there's a road that comes with the fires of affliction. We don't want to take that road either. The only safe road for any of us to take is the road of complete obedience that leads to the everlasting kingdom in heaven. We don't want to take the road of, I had to learn the hard way. We want to take the road to walk with Christ of complete obedience because that's the road that leads to the everlasting kingdom of Christ with complete faith and trust in God. So if we are to walk in the path of righteousness, then we must have the principles of righteousness enshrined in our hearts. And we must listen and obey the voice of the Holy Spirit. Because if we reject the Holy Spirit, we do so at our own peril. Because there will come a time when the Holy Spirit will not strive with those that continually reject the Holy Spirit. So we want to obey and listen to the voice of God. And I want to close with this text from Matthew 7. 13 and 14, we all know the text. I'll go ahead and read it to you. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And that tells us that only a few are going to make it into the kingdom of heaven. The vast majority in the world, and unfortunately the majority in the church, are not going to make it in. We want to be among those that make it into the kingdom. How many of you want to be reunited with all the saints from all the ages on the sea of glass? Amen. I'm going to have a special prayer for all those, and I'm just going to ask you all to bow with me at this time. Heavenly Father, we see the three different roads that many people are taking, but we know there's really only one road that we want to take that leads to the everlasting kingdom of our God. We pray that we will all take the narrow road, that we will listen to the pleadings of the Holy Spirit, that we will allow God to chasten us, rebuke us, to correct us, to help us, to humble our hearts before God, so that we can be willingly obedient and we can be called truly sons and daughters of God when you come to take us home. That's my prayer for each and every one of us. I pray that for myself and I pray that for everyone here within the sound of my voice, that we obey and that we draw close to you while there's still time because we know the winds of strife are coming and many people's hearts will be failing them for fear, but we will not fear because you've not given us the spirit of fear, but you've given us the power of your love and protection that we walk in righteousness and let the light of truth shine upon us and share this truth willingly and lovingly with others. I ask this now in the name of Jesus. Amen.